Well, just to you know, start from the beginning, the iPhone moment obviously was was this uh, a moment in the design of personal technology that that reversed a trend that had been sort of defining industrial design for you know since its inception basically which was that the exterior of the object defined its function and you know the industrial design companies that were working at the behest of companies like Nokia that had dominated the mobile industry previous to that um, their sort of approach always in the design process was to immediately go to uh, sketching of the envelope of a device, you know, sketch the chamfer and, you know, like, for instance, the razor phone, which is kind of the apotheosis of the pre iPhone era, is this kind of celebration of as much kind of techno craft that you could sort of um, smush into a relationship with a device that you were carrying. You know, it had all these crazy angles and weird materials, and it was just this kind of celebration of physical exotica. Um, but I think one of the things that very few people remember that sort of came up after the iPhone was that when you would buy an, a mobile device previous to that, it was an empty shell. You would go to someplace like Best Buy, and there'd be a set of these sort of shiny objects sitting on a shelf, and you'd pick them up, and they had no innards in them. There was no, they, they didn't even have a circuit board inside. It was just the enclosure that you were shopping. That was how you decided as a consumer which phone you were going to buy is by, you know, whether you the enclosure looked sexy in your hand or something like that. There was this moment, you know, in the, in the years leading up to the iPhone where it was pretty obvious to the people, you know, uh, in the software industry that had been working in sort of uh, personal computers and laptops and things like that, that we were headed towards this moment where software was going to arrive in the form factor of this device. And at that moment, uh, everything was going to change in the way that consumers thought about the device because, of course, software is driven by use. Uh, and it's driven by, you know, this relationship that people have to services. And therefore, you know, there was, I, at the time, was working at Frog Design, which is one of the industrial design companies that, that was working on all these phones and we would go to various different manufacturers. We had relationships with al almost all the major phone manufacturers at the time and proposed to them that we would build them a buttonless device that had a touch screen and no one uh, in any of those companies at the time could even imagine that that was possible because that was just, you know, as far as what the sort of consumer drive that was perceived at the time, no one would believe that that was something that people wanted. Even there was a, there was a fervent belief. There was at the time also this rising enthusiasm for BlackBerry devices and things that had physical keyboards on them. And people were thinking, well, this is how software is going to manifest in the devices with a keyboard. But the thing about a keyboard is that it is not uh, a dynamically flexible uh, relationship. Like the, the thing that defined what the phone is now is as blank of a canvas as possible on which the function of software is projected. And so you can have any type of UI that arrives into that space and the user can have a relationship, a branded relationship, which it turns out is the most important part for the, the, you know, sort of on, onset of the marketplace of software for devices, for phones was that, you know, you could manifest the brand of your service and the experience of your service and the sort of differentiating factors of your service into this blank canvas. Uh, and then, you know, so the relationship was between a cloud-based service that was passed through the device to the user. And so the relationship became, became between the user and the service via the device. And so the device um, could extract a tax in the same way that, you know, any kind of purchase inside of a nation state could extract a tax. If you're inside the platform, you can extract a tax, but you don't actually have to be responsible for the function of the service. Now we're, you know, approaching the same moment, you know, in architecture, right? We have like the apotheosis of star architecture, you know, we have, you know, geary buildings that are look almost like the razor. You know, they're sort of these crazy swept metallic surfaces that uh you know are incredibly intensely focused on the aesthetics of the object. But um, the thing that is a, sort of about to happen to the built environment is that uh, people are, you know, right now we have this relationship with software that uh, is brokered by the rectangle, right? Um, but now in the world of Alexa and, you know, this kind of sudden spilling out of software into, into space, uh, we're going to start developing relationships with software that involve our situation rather than what we're holding. And so, in that world where you have a relationship with software via the situation, that means you're inhabiting software. Uh, and that means that the, the sort of differentiation of place is going to be about the way in which the place can 
service that relationship. So how much can the place become a platform for the software that you're inhabiting? Um, and that is, you know, not something that's equally distributed, obviously, in the same way that the iPhone arrived only into elite hands at first. Probably this, this type of relationship with the built environment will arrive only into specific circumstances at first. But I think that there's, there's a huge amount of um, transformation that's about to happen uh, based on that fact. But one of the things that happens in that, in that process is that uh, the build of buildings also gets reversed in the same way that, you know, the iPhone starts now with an operating system and then accretes uh, a piece of hardware around that operating system. A building will start with an information model uh, and the, the building will accrete around that information model. And so the idea that, you know, um, an organization has a relationship with an information model about its situation and that situation can be expressed through the built environment is, you know, it puts the actual accretion of the built environment kind of at the far end of that process. So BIM already, you know, sort of, um, unofficially is the maintainer of this process. But the thing that BIM hasn't done yet is jump between, um, the construction cycle and the inhabitation cycle. So the, the, the thing that needs to happen eventually is that the semantic model that represents the space is operationalized in a way beyond, you know, this kind of set of, um, functionalist uses that the, the build cycle has. But the way that the platformization of space happens is that you have, um, these services almost like, uh, an operating system has drivers. You know, you have these different types of, uh, capabilities, whether they're mediated capabilities or environmental transformation capabilities or, you know, uh, architectural, you know, generator style architectural uh, reconfigurability, um, you know, temperature control and lighting and all these things that people talk about in terms of IoT in the smart house. But but the, the thing that's most interesting about those, once they're platformized, is they become modular uh, and usable by applications that express intents. You know, Android in some ways is a better metaphor for the built environment in the sense that it runs on heterogeneous devices. Uh, you know, iPhone is, you know, five devices actively at most, whereas Android is a huge ecology of all these things that it's embedded inside of. And so partially because of that, um, the s software that runs on Android has to declare what it plans on doing. Android devices in return can, um, declare what they're capable of doing and therefore, you know, uh, make themselves uh, kind of into a match for the software. So, uh, and then possibly the thing that happens on the far end of the relationship with Android devices or with soft architecture in general is that the, the architecture reconfigures itself to be uh, available to those capabilities that the software needs. And so, um, and so you end up in this situation where um, the relationship with the built environment is one uh, of sort of this opportunistic flow into the right spaces you know so the idea that that an individual or an organization can have a relationship with functionality that lives inside of software and that software um sort of inhabits spaces um is is the sort of new relationship that we might find ourselves in uh with with architecture I think that's going to be one of the more interesting things to see that happens as a result of this is how, you know, um, dynamic uh, sort of online communities, and especially in this kind of post Cambridge Analytica era where it seems like there may be a possibility where community begins to shift off of these, you know, cloud brokered platforms of identity and into more, um, you know, for instance, based around the idea of physical community, the idea that maybe your social network is instead something that your building, high density residential building provides, for instance, you know, and that's like a way that you, that you broker your, your identity is through your inhabitation. And that becomes part of, you know, the, the, the baseline, the problem that people are suffering from, I think in general in, in, in their relationship with cloud services right now is that a lot of, a lot of the things that they participate in, they realize they're being exploited by, but they have no alternative. So like, you know, the Airbnb and Uber situation, for instance, is one in which, you know, cities themselves realize that they are, you know, um, subject to uh, value extraction, but they can't actually, they have no, there's no way, their citizens, however, have moved into circumstances where, for instance, Uber often is now the only transit solution that some people have in outlying areas where they have moved, you know, they've, they've moved based on that, on the rationale that they're going to have access to those services. So if the city now in their fight with Uber about regulation says like, you're gone, 
you know, then the citizens are out of luck. And so what that instead means is that, you know, that we might have to start begin looking at some of these things that were considered um, commercial services and they might, it, this, this is maybe another wave of nationalization or urbanization, you know, urbanization in kind of a different word than we usually use, more of a, the governance of cloud services may, may turn into something that urban systems actually do rather than corporate systems in the sense that you will have, you know, if you have a higher density residential building, you will probably have a shared transport solution for that building that is a software mediated solution so that there are 20 cars in the building and they're collaboratively owned by the residents of the building and they have a booking system, you know, that is used by all the residents or maybe even, you know, a situation in which some of the residents are uh, making money as drivers for other residents, vice versa, you know, something like that. Um, but those, those types of, of situations become available once you sort of have layered the, the architectural system with a social system. In fact, the social system is the thing that exists before the architectural system. In many cities, there are these, you know, Baugruppe style solutions where people have done collaborative builds. You know, you can go in, first of all, you can form a financial um, entity uh, as a group that you might not have been able to do as an individual. So if you have 40 people online that say, hey, we all want to live in this neighborhood, then you can qualify for uh, financing that doesn't exist as an individual, uh, rather than sort of, you know, passively moving into something that a developer has decided they needed to build in the space and make money on, you can reverse that equation and say like, oh, we're actually a social group that wants to form a financial vehicle so that we can invest in property, buy some property, and then do a group build in which all of the construction and design services are cloud provided. You know, you could have something as high level as some, as a simulation engine that like automatically designs architecture based on the constraint that your own financial inputs, the zoning, uh, and the types of use that you, that it's anticipating from your own behavior or from what you've, you've told it about your own needs. A lot of people assume when they start talking about, you know, digitally constructed cities, people think, oh, it's like, um, you know, Dubai or Singapore or something where it's like this very top down, you know, like something where you end up with these kind of cubic volumes that look like something out of, you know, uh, uh, some 80s cyberspace movie or whatever, Tron or something like that. But instead, I think that the, po the prospect is that because you can, you can disintermediate the development process that you might end up with these collectivized sets of residents that are building high density residential that are actually quite a bit more differentiated than you'd get if you had an auteur architect to make something that was about the shell. That's, I think, that's when you start getting into high, collectively built high density residential, I think is where you'll start to see something that's very different than, than the kind of, you know, Gary swept surfaces, you know, because that, that's the, the, the real difference, um, it is about inside out rather than outside in. You know, I think a lot of architecture, especially in this architectural era, is about, you know, this iconic skyline type of thing. And that's, in some ways, I think what residents care about. But in other ways, I think it's very much the last thing that they think about after they've satisfied all the needs for their, for their own um, sort of utility. Collaborative citizen-defined architecture is definitely something that's, that's coming, which then leads you, leads one to the understanding of what happens to the role of the architect, and for a long time, I've said that the architect uh, and the planner become uh, game designers because then you end up in this this situation where you're sort of mediating between the constraint space of um, the zoning and planning of of an area and the needs of the user. Also, in the plan, often is a, is a need to have some kind of unifying system around how the neighborhood is expressed, and so if you think of a way to do generative design tools inside of a constraint space of this type of um, aesthetic planning, you end up with something that's very much like a game in the sense that you have a set of tools that a user can exploratively tweak and regenerate systems based on what they think is right for them. And then all of those things are fed into a, this sort of collaboration system where those individual desires are rationalized against each other and some kind of result value comes out of this communal design process. So, um, and this sort of feedback loop of everyone, you know, it's almost like you can imagine people making moves, you know, in their, in their suggestion about, you know, this, um, um, 
almost like a GitHub, GitFlow process, a version control system of someone checking in a new change to what they think their collaborative architecture should look like. And that, you know, that result propagating out to all the potential stakeholders and then deciding, you know, their evaluation of what that means and their, you know, subsequent, um, you know, response, you know, and that, and that process as being this kind of ongoing metabolic process. And that's not something that ends when the building is constructed. If it's dynamic and modular enough, you can imagine like, oh, you know, we have this huge public space in our, in our collaboratively built building. And this year we're going to decide to put a pool in, or this year we're going to decide to get a giant sculpture, or this year we're going to, you know, get a whole bunch of, we're going to build a fab lab in the corner or whatever, you know, just all the, all these sort of, um, abilities to continuously update. Once you have a semantic model that represents the function of the building, you can continue to, you know, um, fork that and, you know, propose alternatives. And then if everyone votes for that, you move the build, you move the construction in that direction. So, so I think that's, um, powerful and also interesting in what it does also for architecture and structural engineering is that it turns their relationship with uh, inhabitants into a service rather than a product, which is what, you know, a lot of times these types of, you know, cloud-based systems do is that you don't end up the, the architecture because it's dynamic and because it needs to be changed means that you will, you know, potentially express a desire for transformation. And then, you know, people either, you know, the people that you've worked with initially can then immediately come in and help you do that transformation, or perhaps you can just, you know, that can be open for bidding and a bunch of different, you know, actors can come in and help you transform the building. But I do think that that, you know, the idea of having a semantic model, particularly one that maintains all of that BIM knowledge, which was from the construction in the first place, means that, you know, there's no, it, it, the, the, the idea of adaptability, the envelope of potential adaptability becomes much bigger rather than like, destroy and rebuild because you have a lot of options uh, in terms of like the structural extension and transformation and things like that.